abbiamo invitato eh, il professor Peter Heather, eh, che terrà due lezioni eh, su temi eh, strettamente legati alla, alle prospettive storiche che abbiamo, eh, trattato, che abbiamo trattato a lezione. Eh, è, una, è una grande fortuna avere il professor Heather qui a, qui a Pisa, perché come eh, saprete sicuramente il professore è uno degli storici contemporanei che eh, più efficacemente e con ampi riconoscimenti ha contribuito al progresso delle nostre conoscenze relativamente all'Europa tardo antica e alto medievale. Uso questi termini servendomi di una periodizzazione molto tradizionale. Uh, non so se um, sia un, uh, un uso corretto quello di queste categorie per, per, uh, per descrivere l'approccio del professor Heather a questi, a, questi, a questi problemi. Sapete che il problema, il tema della periodizzazione del, del livello di continuità o di discontinuità tra uh, età antica e età medievale è uno dei grandi temi del, uh, del dibattito storiografico contemporaneo. Ci sono scuole diverse, ci sono approcci, approcci differenti e, uh, uh, in cui appunto si, uh, si dibatte su, su questo, su, uh, su dove siano i limiti, dove, uh, dove sia possibile collocare le grandi, eh, le grandi cesure, se grandi cesure, se grandi cesure ci sono. E, eh, diciamo così, il, il lavoro mh, del professor Heather eh, occupa questo, questo segmento importante eh, della storia che va dal, appunto dai secoli tradizionalmente, eh, in qualche modo così, eh, della tarda storia romana fino a quelli appunto del, eh, dell'alto medioevo e non soltanto. E non soltanto. Eh, per chi come me ha, ha studiato per tanti anni eh, la storia dei, eh, dei goti, in particolare come sapete la storia del, dell'Italia ostrogota, ehm, i lavori del professor Eder sono imprescindibili da tanti punti di vista, eh, perché eh, gli studi sul mondo dei goti e su, in particolare sugli ostrogoti sono stati studi fondamentali eh, e sono anche gli studi da cui eh, il professore è partito diciamo così, nella sua, nel, suo percorso, nel suo percorso accademico eh, a partire dagli anni del, del PhD che è stato dedicato appunto al, a uno studio sul, sui movimenti di queste popolazioni eh, nella penisola balcanica tra, appunto, tra metà IV e, eh, e fine V e fine secolo. E fine secolo. Uh, ai Goti, uh, questo, questo tema così complesso, uh, il professor Heather ha dedicato alcune, uh, alcune monografie, in particolare eh, la monografia del 1991 sui rapporti tra goti e romani tra diciamo così l'età di Costantino e l'età di eh, tra Odoacre e Teoderico e poi la grande monografia la grande monografia sui goti del, 1900, del 1996 eh, ha affrontato tematiche difficili che riguardano, che riguardano temi importanti come quello dell'identità dell dei goti della formazione di queste, eh, di queste popolazioni, che è un tema estremamente discusso eh, e che ha delle ricadute importanti anche da un punto di vista eh, appunto, mh, più ampio, che non riguarda soltanto, che non riguarda soltanto la, eh, la storia antica o medievale. Eh, e si è occupata appunto di mondo ostrogoto, mondo visigoto, di, di installazioni delle popolazioni eh, barbariche nell'Europa nell post-romana. Eh, post uh, il riconoscimento che gli è stato uh, così eh, tributato come esperto di storia romana tardo-antica è ampio, uh, benché sia un professore di storia medievale, e uh, insomma, una delle manifestazioni più evidenti è la 
è la, la scelta del professor Heather come estensore di alcune voci della, Cambridge, della seconda edizione della Cambridge Ancient History, eh, peraltro si è occupato anche di, eh, di Senato, per cui eh, diciamo così, la mia, la mia uh, riconoscenza nei suoi confronti è... Uh, Tocca, tocca più punti. Um, negli, anni, negli anni più recenti eh, appunto que, questi temi sono stati sviluppati in diverse, in diverse, in diverse, dire, di, in diverse direzioni e eh, in qualche modo c'è stata una focalizzazione su delle prospettive che riguardano il tema della, uh, delle migrazioni, il tema delle migrazioni come anche appunto temi legati al, appunto, agli spostamenti delle persone, ai movimenti, in questa età appunto così inquieta, così piena di uh, di instabilità, di instabilità. Uh, sono interessanti alcuni titoli dei contributi più recenti che riguardano il tema dei rifugiati, delle migrazioni, dei movimenti, dei movimenti di, uh, di persone e anche i, i temi di cui parlerà oggi e domani sono dei temi che come vi renderete conto riguardano sì appunto la storia antica, la storia medievale, ma sono dei grandi, eh, dei grandi tematiche eh, che in qualche modo hanno un'importanza un più ampia, un'importanza un più generale, perché riguardano appunto la formazione dell'Europa, la fondazione dell'Europa e quindi mh, il rapporto, in questo caso, il rapporto alla formazione del cristianesimo e quindi si tratta di temi importanti che riguardano appunto eh, dibattito politico e, attuale e il modo attraverso cui, attraverso cui i contemporanei interpretano, interpretano il proprio passato. Lascio dunque la parola al professor Heather per questa prima delle due elezioni che ha avuto la gentilezza di tenere per noi. Grazie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for turning out in the rain. Uh, makes me feel at home. Uh, except, of course, in England it's dry and sunny. So. <laughs> uh, you're living in the wrong country. No. <laughs> the food is definitely better here. Um, and I know the weather is normally as well. Um, Thank you very much to Fabrizio for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. Um, I do realize that um, I have written more words about the Goths over the last 30 years, actually close to 40 years, than anyone should. So I won't be talking about Goths at all today. No Goths. <laughs> uh, I might mention them tomorrow, but only briefly. <laughs> Um, the, the two lectures um, I'm doing here, and I, I should apologize that I can't um, lecture to you in Italian. Um, my education is deficient. I can read Italian, but I can't speak it with any fluency. Um, so I do apologize for that. Um, I will try to speak slowly and clearly. Um, I occasionally speak too fast when I become excited, so... I will try to stay calm. Um, but these two lectures are part of uh, my current project, um, my current interests. I've, I've been, well, you don't teach late Roman history or early medieval history without thinking about Christianity, obviously. So in one sense, I've been thinking about it for 35 years. <laughs> yeah, time flies. Um, but uh, I've been working on this project for six or seven years more intensively. And it, it's, it's really the, the sort of bigger problem of um, how and why Europe becomes the center of a, a dominant Christian culture, Christendom. So these two lectures are part of that bigger story. This is where the thing is coming from. Um, and the uh, initial focus is thinking about the relationship between um, developing Christianity uh, and the late Roman Empire. Um, and this is what today's lecture is about. Uh, 
And I would say if you look at the uh, literature that's around at the moment, um, general models of current interpretation, historiographical understanding, and so on, ascribe only a, relative, only a relatively limited role in this overall triumph of Christian cultural structures to the fact that Christianity became the official religion eventually of the Roman state. That fact is of course acknowledged, you can't not acknowledge it, um, but uh, nonetheless, this is seen as a relatively minor um, incidental development in the history of Christianity rather than something fundamental. Uh, I think that this sort of relative minimization of the importance of that relationship with the Roman Empire is based uh, on two fundamental uh, points. First of all, relatively high estimates of how many people were already Christian in the early fourth century before Constantine declares a Christian allegiance. Um, so we got quite high numbers of Christians anyway before the Roman state starts to get involved in Christianity. You'll see the figure of 10% very commonly in the literature, already being 10% of the Roman population is already Christian before Constantine converts. Sometimes you'll see as many as 20%. But the 10 to 20% number you'll see quite a lot. I'll come back to where this comes from. So on the one hand, we have quite a lot of Christians already and the trajectory of the Roman population, Roman imperial population, is towards becoming Christian, that would suggest. Then the second point is uh, a stress, particularly, I think, in Anglophone literature on late antiquity. Um, associate it certainly with Peter Brown and uh, lots of people who are influenced by him. But the suggestion that the Roman state, the Roman imperial state, is not that big a phenomenon. It lacks the capacity to change much in terms of people's behavior. As Peter Brown puts it in his works on uh, the spread of Christianity in the, the late Roman period, it's as much as the Roman state can do to raise taxes. It has no other capacity. This is uh, so it doesn't have the capacity to spread Christianity. The best it can do is to bring the money in. That's it. So we have lots of Christians anyway. We have uh, a Roman state machinery which is not capable of effecting great change. Uh, and between them, those two points of departure suggest that um, the fact that the Roman state became Christian is uh, an effect of the rise of Christianity, if you like, not a cause. You know, Christianity was going to rise anyway. What I'm going to argue today uh, is that there is good reason, I think, for questioning both of those perspectives uh, and therefore for recasting, rewriting our understanding of what the relationship between the Roman state and the triumph of Christianity actually was. So let's return to this first question of numbers. How many Christians were there in the early fourth century? As I said, you'll see the figure 10% quoted quite a lot um, in some of the more ambitious Francophone uh, French, especially French Catholic historiography, you'll see 20%. But you'll certainly see 10% a lot. And if you look at the footnotes uh, where 10% is quoted, um, certainly in works of the last 20 years or so, you'll find the name of uh, an American 
sociologist of religion called Rodney Stark. Uh, I think people had always guessed 10%. I think that was an intuitive number that had been picked out of the air. But Rodney Stark's uh, work on um, religious conversion gave a kind of mathematical respectability to this figure of 10%. And you'll see now that where it's quoted, and in fact his work came out in the mid-1990s, I think, I can't remember, I think it's 1997, something like that, I can't remember exactly. But since then, whenever the 10% is quoted, you'll find Rodney Stark there. Uh, where did Rodney Stark get to 10% from? His mathematical model is based on work that he did um, on religious conversion in the modern world, and it suggested to him that uh, religions convert uh, at a steady pace. Uh, and it, the, what he was looking at, he came up with the figure of a 40% increase in every generation. So if there were 10 Christians in generation one, there would be 14 Christians in generation two. Uh, and then there would be, well, you can do 40% of 14 and add it. Um, uh, so there'd be, there'd be sort of uh, about 20 in generation three, etc. And he sort of made a guess as to, you know, several tens of Christians at the time of Christ's crucifixion, added 10% for every 25 year period, uh, and from there you get up to about a 10% total conversion by about the year 300. But always this steady state, so 40% more Christians in every generation. If you look at the effect of that mathematical model on total numbers, it means to start with, they rise very slowly. You know, 10 in the first generation, 14 in the next. It's not very many people more. But when you start to get a lot of Christians, then a 40% increase increases it very quickly. So you get a geometric progression in the end. So in fact, uh, if you look at Stark's own projections and the way he plays with the numbers, if you have 10% Christians in 300 AD, you will have... 40 to 50% Christians by 350 AD, and you will have 100% Christians by 400 AD. So that's, that's the mathematics of the model. Uh, believing Christians like it very much, like this model, because of course it would suggest that if you've got 10% Christians in the year 300, you'll have 100% Christians in the year 400, and the Roman state has got absolutely nothing to do with this. It was going to happen anyway. <laughs> but yeah, this is actually, well, you know, I'm being polite. It doesn't work. It isn't right. In fact, you can show from Stark's own predictions they don't work. You know, take the year 400. Year 400, um, well, think, think about it this way. 85% uh, of the population live in the countryside. 10 to 15% of the population live in towns. In both the eastern and the western halves of the Roman Empire, we know that the big initiatives, and I'll come back to these in more detail uh, a bit later on, to spread Christianity into the countryside come in the 6th century, after 500 AD, after the fall of the Western Empire, in fact. That Christianity has barely begun to penetrate the countryside in um, 400 AD. The idea that you've got 100% Christians in 400 AD it's just nowhere close to the mark. You know, you, you can't have a majority of the, even a majority of the Roman imperial population as Christian by the year 400, let alone everybody. 
because we haven't got into the countryside yet. And likewise, the 50% figure for 350 AD is just as problematic. What I'd suggest to you, though, even more, is that if you think about it very hard, this 10% figure for 300 AD is, again, just as problematic. It's way too high, actually. Um, let's, let's do it a different way. So there are 1,800 kivitates in the total empire, uh, 1,800 kivitas communities, administrative units. The best guess is that by the time of the Council of Nicaea in 325, about 600 of these kivitates had a bishop, which means an organized Christian community. So only one third of all the kivitates of the empire had an organized Christian community. And at that point, Christianity is largely confined to towns, and the urban population is 10 to 15 percent. So actually, the maximum possible Christian population is one third of 15 percent, i.e. 5 percent. That's the absolute maximum. But in fact, nowhere in none of these kivitates are Christians a majority in 300, 320 AD. You know, um, our, one of our best documented cases is Antioch, where there's a lot of writing from Antioch. And Antioch is the oldest continuous Christian community that there is in the entire empire, because Jerusalem, obviously, that was broken up with the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So Antioch is the oldest, the most continuous Christian community in the entire empire. But in 370 AD, Christians are not yet a majority in Antioch. They're a big community, but they're only, you know, a third, a quarter. You know, it's a lot of people, but it's only 25, 30% of the Antiochian population in 370, later on, is Christian. So, even in the one-third of Kivitates that have a Christian community, it's still only a minority of that. So, you know, less than half of the 5% that has an organized Christian community are actually Christians in the time of Constantine. Myself, I don't see how you get the total number of Christians above one and a half to two percent, really, and that's still quite optimistic. It could easily be lower than that. It's certainly nowhere near 10 percent. You know, 10 percent would require virtually the entire urbanized population of the empire everywhere to be Christian. And we know that's not true. We know it's not even nearly true. You know, we're miles from that in the time of Constantine. It's not close. So, you know, actual number of Christians against the total population of the empire, one and a half, two percent, not more. That must be about right, actually. So why is Stark so wrong? Well, I think it's pretty easy when you read. What did Stark study? study Stark studied the spread of uh, allegiance to Jehovah's Witnesses and to Mormons in America between 1945, 1940, and 1970. So over two generations. It's a huge assumption to think that what worked over two generations will work over uh, 12 generations from the time of Christ to the time of Constantine. You know, even a sort of simple model, you're bound to run into competition from other uh, religions much more. So, you know, you would expect a fairly steep curve to start with and then it tailing off a bit. So, you know, it's, a, it's an absolutely heroic assumption that you would have this steady rate of 40% more of each religion in, as the generations go by. So I think it's pretty clear where the problem lies with that. So there aren't many Christians. There really aren't many Christians. Um, there are more than there used to be, but you know, there aren't many Christians in the empire 
in 300 AD. First point. Second point is to think about conversion, to think about what it means. Well, we probably, there are inherited images of what conversion looks like, and they're in the canon of Christian literature. If you read Acts uh, chapter 9, Paul, St. Paul on the road to Damascus, vision, blindness, talking to God or Christ talking to him, why do you persecute me? Uh, incredibly intense personal experience. We have the same kind of image of conversion um, in many other texts. Uh, Augustine, Augustine in the Confessions. Augustine, uh, Book 8, Chapter 12, in the garden, in despair. He doesn't know what to do with his life. And he gets this voice. Couldn't tell if it was a little boy or a little girl. Singing a song from next door. Uh, it says, take up and read. Take up and read. Not a very obvious thing for a child to be singing. Uh, so he takes it as a message from God. From, it's another message from God like, uh, he wasn't struck blind like St. Paul, but it's another direct, intense message from God. And he picks up the Bible. He takes it as a message that he should pick up the Bible and read whatever passage it opens up. It opens up the passage, says, Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Sorry about the sort of old-fashioned English. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Give up everything to do with this world. Conversion is about an intense experience of God which makes you change your life. Constantine, too. This uh, vision in the sky. So we know what Christian conversion is. Quite straightforward, isn't it? You have a socking great vision of the Almighty and you utterly change your life. Well, some do, but other conversion is actually very different to that. Doesn't fit the Augustine or Paul model. Actually, Constantine's conversion is worth a closer look. Constantine's conversion is very interesting indeed. If you look at his coinage and you look at the public statements of his regime, there are four different uh, religious policies followed explicitly and publicized during Constantine's 31-year uh, reign. From 306 to 309, he follows tetrarchic, existing tetrarchic religious policies. From 309 to 313, Sol Invictus. 313 to 324, anonymous solar monotheism in most contexts, but when he speaks to Christians, he declares himself a Christian. So that, that, there's a sort of intermediate phase after the Milvian Bridge where if he's talking to Christians, he talks uh, Christian talk, but in other contexts, it's uh, uh, a less explicit, clearly monotheistic, but less explicitly Christian monotheistic, than 324 onwards, absolutely Christian monotheism, straightforward and in public. What's so very interesting about these four phases, apart from the fact they exist, is that each transition follows, follows, doesn't proceed, follows a victory. So the change from tetrarchic religious ideology to solar monotheism follows uh, his defeat of Maximian um, in southern Gaul. The change from solar monotheism to, well, it's still solar monotheism to most contexts, but a bit of Christian when talking to Christians. That's after the defeat of Maxentius and the Milvian Bridge. 
the absolutely unambiguous Christianity follows the eventual defeat of Licinius and the unification of the empire. What this tells me is that you cannot tell a bloody thing about Constantine's internal state of mind from his public declarations, because his public declarations change when it is safe for him to change them. Uh, at least part of the story of Constantine is not conversion in the Paul on the road to Damascus sense, but of coming out as Christian when it's safe to come out as Christian, slowly declaring his Christian allegiance to um, the world at large. And victory, is, of course, in the Roman ideological system is the great legitimizing act because victory is brought by God. So as soon as someone wins a victory, they can, uh, an emperor wins a victory, it is easy for them to claim that God is supporting them. And that, of course, is the moment to turn around and say, well, you know I said before it was Jove. Uh, well, actually, it's Sol Invictus who's supporting me. Or after the defeat of Maxentius, um, I said it was Sol Invictus before, but actually, you know, it was the Christian God. Yeah. When, I, I've no doubt that Constantine is a Christian by the end of his reign, when he became a Christian, I think is very difficult actually to tell. In fact, impossible methodologically. So Constantine's conversion is, doesn't fit that flashing light in the sky model. And if you go looking for other examples, you soon find types of Christian conversion that don't fit that model at all. Very late 4th century, Synesius becomes Bishop of Cyrene. Synesius is a late Neoplatonist, doesn't believe many Christian dogmas. Uh, he tells the people who want to make him Bishop of Cyrene that he doesn't believe them. And they say, that's all right, as long as in public, in church, you don't say it. So they allow him to become Bishop of Cyrene, even though his philosophical stance, uh, it's creation, a final judgment, you know, a few quite basic features of Christianity that uh, Synesius finds trouble with. His conversion is not a flashing light on the road to Damascus, Cyrene, or anywhere else. Uh, it's a very different kind of phenomenon. And then there's my favorite person in the whole of late antiquity. Absolute favorite person. He's a man called Pegasios, who's Bishop of Ilios, Troy, Schliemann's Troy. And we hear about him because uh, Julian, Julian the Apostate, wants to make a visit to Troy uh, because uh, all the... Uh, you know, by this stage, you, the sort of Neoplatonic exegesis of the Iliad is a, a central statement of Hellenic religion. That's, uh, the Iliad is a kind of biblical source text for the way that um, Greek, late Greek philosophy uh, interprets. Julian had heard that the temples at Ilios were destroyed. This is letter 19, Julian's 19th letter in the B-Day edition. When he gets there, they're not destroyed. And actually, Pegasios, the bishop, gives him a guided tour. And he finds that not only are the temples not destroyed, but Pegasios has been looking after them. So they're all lit with candles. Uh, the statue of Hector in the temple to Hector is covered in olive oil. It's greasy and you know, glistening. It's been cared for. And the reason that we hear about this is that the letter doesn't belong to the early 350s when the visit was made. The letter dates to about 10 years later when Julian is emperor and sole emperor after the defeat of Constantius. Um, and at that point, Pegasios has applied for a job in Julian's pagan priesthood. So we have a bishop of Ilios 
who'd protected the pagan temples and now wants a job in Julian's pagan counterpart to the Christian priesthood. So what kind of conversion is that? That's a rhetorical question. I have no idea. Uh, you can make an, any answer you like to that, any combination of answers to that. But the fact is that Pegas Pegasios is real. And the other fact to bear in mind is that between Nicaea in 325 and the late 4th century, we've had to find 1,200 bishops for all those civitates that didn't used to have a bishop and didn't have one in 325. So who are these people? Synesius, Pegasios? Are we sure that most people's Christian conversions are more like those of Augustine and Paul than Synesius and Pegasius? Actually, we're not. We really don't know. The assumption is there that this is what Christian conversion is. Intense, sudden, complete. There's plenty of evidence for other types of conversion. And obviously, I can't answer that rhetorical question that I've just made as to whether Augustine is more typical or Pegasios is more typical or maybe a combination of Synesius and Pegasius. It's more typical, the kind of spectrum. Uh, my intuition is that intense spiritual experiences are less rare rather than more common. But you know, that's just an intuition on my part. It probably shows the poverty of my own spiritual experience uh, rather than being a kind of historical fact to uh, stand a whole argument on. But I do think that we can do a bit better, um, that we can think more about patterns of conversion in the late Roman Empire and shed some light on this rhetorical question about whether Augustine or Pegasios uh, is, or Pegasius strokes Synesius, gives us a better benchmark for thinking about what Christian conversion was actually like in the late Roman period. And, and there's been a lot of work in the last 40 years on conversion in the late uh, Roman Empire. As I said, uh, what's become very clear is that in the late Roman period, at least in the West down to you know, the mid-5th century, Christian conversion did not massively affect the countryside. Um, there are very few churches being built in the countryside. Um, in the diocese of Tours um, in central France, in the mid sixth century, the average distance that most people live from a church is 10 kilometers. That's the average distance. In other words, if you want to go to church on a Sunday, you've got a 20 kilometer walk. You've got to go there and you've got to go back again. So, you know, I know how many people I think were going to church uh, in Tours in the, in the mid-6th century, and it's not very many. And actually, there's a whole series of uh, other bits of evidence from, as I said, from East and West, that it is, it is in the 6th century that the problem of the countryside, of spreading Christianity effectively into, into the countryside, of reaching this 85% of the population who were dispersed as peasantry right across the map, that that's when the Christian leaderships in Eastern and Western, or former Roman West and still Roman East, that's when they're addressing that problem. Not before. So peasant conversion is not a late Roman phenomenon, uh, at least in West, it's a post-Roman phenomenon. What conversion do we see in the 4th and early 5th century. The pattern, uh, Peter Brown's work, Kim Bowe's work, uh, lots of other people as well have contributed to this, is one of a sort of silent elite conversion in the three generations after Constantine, the period between 325 to 400, 
Uh, we have some individual biographies like, say, the Cappadocian Fathers or whatever. So you have a few standout individual, or Ambrose in the West, Augustine similarly in the West. So there are a few individuals we know quite a lot about, but it is clear that most of the Roman elite by the 390s uh, has come on board with Christianity, that the landowning elite has done so. But we don't hear a lot about them. But we know they are because in the 390s you get uh, aggressive legislation which bans members of the elite who are pagans from holding public office and which shuts down temples and allows them to be destroyed. And what's very interesting is that there's no real resistance to this legislation in the 310s or to the um, uh, autonomous initiatives taken by, say, Egyptian monks in the 410s um, or the 420s, people like Chanute, whose uh, works have just become available in a sort of in English translation, so we can all see them. Uh, there's one sort of lesser Egyptian landowner that Shunute has to take on, but that's all. There isn't any kind of concerted uh, classical paganism amongst the elite. Um, so, and as Peter Brown puts it, the violence is telling you that com the, the key, key conversion of the elite has already happened. That's why, the, that's why the local violence can happen, because there's no one who's come in a, any position of uh, social authority who's trying to resist it. So the pattern, I think, is quite clear. We get um, elite conversion, 325 to 400. This makes it possible, then, for the kind of uh, violent um, destruction of a lot of public, the remnants of public paganism. The pattern is clear, but it's unexplained. Why is this happening? If you read um, Brown's latest big book, um, biggest book, Eye of the Needle, where he's talking about the way that uh, wealth, Christians, deal with the problem of wealth. I mean, <laughs> this becomes a big problem uh, when you start to convert rich members of the Roman landowning elite. What do we do about the fact they're so wealthy? When Christ says it's easier for uh, a man to pass through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. We've obviously got to solve this problem somehow. <laughs> so, but, so his book is looking at the way that Christian commentators come to find uh, a way to live with rich supporters. But, the, but what's running through as a kind of backstory is this pattern of elite conversion, but it's not explained. Why is it happening? Why do we have elite conversion over these three generations? We clearly do, but why is it happening? This is where I think uh, writing in the 21st century rather than the late 19th or early 20th century means that you've got more to explain. When you look at the sort of grand narratives of Christian, the spread of Christianity that are written, say, by Harnack, late 19th, early 20th century, or even in the 1950s, Yaroslav Pelikan, I remember hearing him lecture in the mid-1980s, there wasn't really anything to explain because Christianity had won in the fourth century and it just carried on winning ever since. It was obviously just a better religion. That's why it won. There wasn't, you know, you didn't have to explain why it won. It just carried on winning. Of course it's going to win. <laughs> you don't need to think about anything more specific than that. But I think from an early 21st century European perspective, that's, an, that's not a good enough answer. Because um, if you look at patterns of believing and non-believing in Europe, at least, 
despite the fact that a lot of right-wing politicians go on about Europe being particularly Christian, hardly anybody is going to church. If they call themselves Christian, they mean it in a sort of general cultural kind of sense. They certainly don't mean that they have a regular spiritual life based on the sacraments um, and that this is uh, uh, intensely central to their identity as a human being. In fact, Christianity has lost its hold on the majority of the European population. Um, science and secularism and loss of a sense that we're all going to die, <laughs> who knows what, has undermined it. It's just not there. So in fact, the pattern is Christianity won in the fourth century. It won in a lot of other contexts, but it hasn't won forever. Or at least it's not clear now, writing now, that it's won forever. I mean, I might be wrong. Christianity will outlive me, and maybe everyone will go back to being intense Christians. So somehow I doubt it, but that's possible. I can see it's possible. But certainly in the last hundred years or so, you've got to say Christianity's lost. Lost in the sense of keeping an intense hold over the imaginations and intelligence and spiritual lives and cultural orientation uh, and engagement of the majority of the European population. It's just not true. Even if people are calling themselves Christian, they don't mean it in um, an intensely religious sense. And that then re-asks the question, it seems to me, at each point where you see Christianity gaining a new audience of adherence. Why is it winning in that context? We shouldn't just assume that it's always going to win because we know it doesn't. We have, as historians, to ask the question, why is it winning? What's going on? And especially when we're faced with a lot of evidence about conversion, which suggests that a lot of the people who are declaring themselves as Christian really aren't very Christian at all. Pegasius was a fucking bishop. How Christian was he? <laughs> you, know. you answer that question. I don't know the answer. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure if you said, uh, if you passed him a form and said, you know, tick which box you are, in the 350s, he's ticking the Christian box. In the 360s, he's happy to tick the, I'd like to be a pagan priest box, please. Thank you. So, you know, what exactly uh, is going on here? Uh, what is this conversion process that's bringing members of the Roman landowning elite um, in such a strong way towards Christianity? To my mind, a good way into this is to think a bit harder about the role of the Roman state, or at least the role of Roman public life. I mean, I, I've used the word um, Roman state in the title of the lecture. I think in a way it's really more public life would be the better word to use, but you can think about that and what I'm talking about. As I said, there's an assumption that the Roman state couldn't have converted anybody because it's too feeble to change anyone's behavior. How true is that? Well, let's think about Pegasios. In one sense, Pegasus's biography proves how weak the Roman state is. He can pretend to be a Christian when he's not. Julian thinks the temples have been destroyed. They haven't been. Presumably, Pegasios sent in a report under the reign of Constantius II saying, yep, I've destroyed the temples. And no one knows. The Roman state can't gather information about every locality. You know, the bloody thing runs from Scotland to Iraq and things move at 20, well, about 35 kilometers a day. Information gathering about what's going on in local communities uh, in that kind of pre-industrial context on that kind of geographical scale is so difficult. You've no idea at the center what's happening in localities or in most of them. And if someone sends you a report saying, yep, I've destroyed the temples, then you have no alternative way of checking that out. So in one sense, the Pegasus story sort of confirms 
the weakness view of the late Roman state. In another sense, it doesn't, because the other interesting thing is that he'd bothered to pretend. He'd sent in a note saying, I've destroyed the temples. Why did he do that? And actually, when you stop and think about it, there are at least two ways uh, where the operations of the Roman state impinge very directly on the lives of members of the landowning elite. First of all, by the fourth century, uh, after the third century crisis, we have a new taxation system, a much more direct taxation system. Uh, and we know that to run that taxation system, in every kivitas, so in every kivitas capital, there was a list. There was the list of every landowning estate, a list of who owned it, and a list of its notional productive value. That is the information that you required in order to tax agriculture at source. That information was collected uh, systematically, it seems, for the first time under the Tetrarchs. It's then revised every 15 years. Hold on to the 15 years. I'll come back to that in a minute. So Roman taxation affects all landowners, right? Second thing that where the Roman state really matters to people is law. Roman law is 95% of it is about property. It's, it defines who owns property. It defines how property is handed down from generation to generation. It defines how to do leases, how to do marriage contracts, how to do rental agreements, how to do wills, how to control property safely. It's, you know, cr Roman criminal law is really simple. Execute anyone who does anything or send them to the mines. It's very, that part of it is very short. Roman civil law, property law, that's the complicated bit. <coughs> when Justinian is creating the Corpus Juris Civilis in the 6th century, the millions and millions of lines of commentary and law is about property. It's not about criminal law. Criminal law is a little pamphlet. It's about that size. Property law is what it's all about. And this is uh, an area, both of these areas are worth then thinking about further. Because law is enforced through a system of courts and courts, uh, the judges, are provincial governors. But, judge, but the provincial governor is not a sort of simple judge in our sense. He's more of a court president. When he judges cases, he sits with representatives of local landowning society to decide them. So he doesn't just decide by himself. He has a, a panel of leading local citizens sitting with him. And as the fourth century progresses, and more and more of local landowning society makes its way into the imperial bureaucracy, it is ex-imperial bureaucrats who sit with the governor to decide cases. So local men who went to the center, did their time in the imperial bureaucracy, came back home, the so-called honorati. They're the people who sit with the governor. Also taxation. Remember, it gets revised every 15 years. The people who advise on the reallocation of tax bills every 15 years are, again, the same honorati. They're also given that job. So what we're seeing in the course of the fourth century is uh, an imperial bureaucratic system which interferes both in how you legally transmit your law and any pot potential disputes, and also in your tax bills not only just setting them originally, but in any revision to your tax bills. You can imagine that as the 15 years come by, the honorati who's going to reallocate tax bills in your local community becomes very popular. Lots of invitations to dinner. 
I'm way overtaxed. In fact, the best thing to do would be invite him to dinner, but serve him a terrible dinner, saying, I'm sorry, I can't afford anything better. Is there any chance I could be, you know, slightly lower tax for the next 15 years? <coughs> and in fact, we know that this is how late Roman uh, elites, this is what they're worried about. If you look in the Cappadocian Fathers in those letter collections or Libanius, it's constant barrage of request for favors on tax bills and legal cases. That's what they're trying to use their connections to the center to achieve. So the Roman state does matter to people. It matters in a quite profound way. And it matters in an even more profound way because what used to be called curial flight, the disappearance of the town councils uh, in uh, numbers of town councillors in the fourth century, we actually now know that that's not quite accurately what's going on. What's really happening is that a series of um, different incentives are making people who used to sit on town councils want to join the imperial bureaucracy. Not least the fact that these imperial bureaucrats get to do all these interesting jobs back in local society, setting taxes, helping the governor decide legal cases. So, not only is the Roman state machinery more important to you in the fourth century for legal terms, and I should have said that the third century change which sees everyone become a Roman citizen means that you've got to do it by Roman law now for the first time. Up to the third century, a lot of what's being done is being done on local legal um, terms. Once everyone's a Roman citizen, you've got to do it in terms of Roman law. That's a huge change. So because, and because emperors control Roman law, the Roman state system or its public life becomes very important to you. Taxation, the intrusion of the state into local economics, that also makes the Roman state much more important to you than it's been in the past. And then the shift of local elites into imperial service, uh, getting bureaucratic jobs, or even just getting honorary bureaucratic jobs. We know that a lot of people didn't actually want a job. They just wanted an honorary grant of having the equivalent status of someone who'd had a bureaucratic job. But, you know, those letters don't arrive through the post. You don't write your own honorary letter. You have to get someone in the center to organize that letter to be sent to you. So even getting an honorary job involves you in dealing with this imperial system. So, Actually, the overall point that I'm trying to make is that although the imperial governmental system remains just as clumsy and just as inefficient as it had ever been, there's a whole sequence of new motivations which mean that local provincial elites have to engage with it in a much more intense way in the fourth century than had ever been true before. Tax, law, and the new bureaucratic careers. You know, and those bureaucratic careers are affecting a lot of people. In uh, the middle of the third century, there are about 250 senior administrative jobs in the entire empire. By 400 AD, there are 3,000 in each half of the empire, which is a 20-fold increase, and there are waiting lists. So there are people waiting for those jobs to appear. It's just like the Italian civil service. You know, it's exactly the same kind of phenomenon. Uh, that's a lot of people queuing up to get themselves into the system because the system is so important in their lives. I mean, I do think it's more public life than the state, if you like, but it's really important to people. Throw into that picture the perception that while emperors don't refuse ever to support pagans, they slightly favor Christians. And we know that that perception is out there. There's plenty of evidence for that in the sources. Throw that into the picture, and you can see that actually maybe the Roman state does play a substantial role in elite conversion. If you think you're going to get a better tax deal, or you're going to get a better job, or you're going to get your legal cases coming out better if you're known to be a Christian, even if you're not, even if you're like Pegasius, 
then you will let it be known unless you are really determined otherwise, unless you're a Julian. If you can find a way to live with the emperor's Christianity, you will do so. And we know that that perception is there. There's plenty of um, evidence for that. Elites, I think, and this is the more general point, are particularly vulnerable to system change where system involves religious change. I mean, Henry VIII's gentry all become Protestant in England in the reign of Elizabeth. Why do they do that? Because they stand to lose everything if they don't change. Why, do, why does the principle that uh, a German prince in the Reformation decides the religious allegiance of his uh, particular land, why does that work? That works for the same reason. You know, peasants don't have anything to lose. Gentry have a lot to lose. Gentry landowners, uh, your land is the basis of all your elite status and all your wealth. Uh, if public life is taking on a new cultural tone which demands that you at least publicly come into line with what's declared, you will do so. Because if you don't, one of your peer competitors, another member of the local gentry, will jump on you. You will get a higher tax bill. You will lose your legal cases. Um, you won't get the job or your children. Worse, we all worry. You know, most of you are too young, but those of us older, we worry about our children all the time. Our children being disadvantaged is a huge problem. You know. So if you have to become at least notionally a, a Pegasius or a Synesius type Christian in order to ensure that your children do successfully in life, you will do so. So this silent conversion over three generations of the Roman landed elite, I think, uh, given that we can't just say Christianity is a better religion which always wins, I think there's a very strong case to be made that uh, the operations of the public life of the Roman Empire played a very profound role in that. And I think that apart from the sort of lining up the evidence um, from Themistius and Palladius and others about the way in which the perception that you do slightly better uh, being Christian under Christian emperors uh, and there is plenty of that. I think you can support it in another way. And it's uh, time to stop pretty much, but I'll just take two minutes to outline the other line of support for this. And that is to think about Christianity itself. The normal title for books on this subject is The Christianization of the Roman State. So the Roman state is changed by Christianity. An equally important trajectory of an analysis, which has not been pursued properly, is the Romanization of Christianity. This engagement of Christianity in the Roman state changes Christianity at least as much as it changes the Roman Empire, um, just quickly a few ways. So we go from Christianity in about 300 is a small, rigorous, religious sect. To join it, you have to go through several stages of entry, very fierce rules of behavior, to meet with your exorcist once a day for two months before you're baptized. Baptism is at the end of a multi-year process, and very intense behavioral demands. There's a huge argument in early fourth century Christianity about whether one, if you sin after you've been baptized, can you be forgiven? They eventually decide you can, but you know, that tells you how intense this is. Engagement with the Roman Empire turns Christianity into a mass religion. So infant baptism, or very short 20-day baptism for adults, much looser uh, behavioral demands. Yes, you can certainly be forgiven, even quite major sins after you've been introduced into the community. Authority structures of the empire. Christianity before Constantine is a series of autonomous 
communities dotted around the Mediterranean in little regional clusters. There's no central decision-making mechanism. Uh, that comes with the empire. And the central decision-making um, mechanism is the ecumenical council. Who calls ecumenical councils? Emperors. Who sets the agendas of ecumenical councils? Emperors. Who enforces the decisions of uh, ecumenical councils? Emperors. So we turn Christianity from uh, a rigorous sect to a mass religion, from a set of autonomous communities into a coherent whole. We also, I mean, most of these ecumenical councils are about the, the creation of a unified set of doctrines. So we actually created unified Christianity in the late Roman period. Um, you do have this myth that there's an orthodoxy uh, what has been believed everywhere by everyone at all times, as Vincent of Lorraine puts it in the 5th century. But it's quite clear that in the early 4th century, these different regional clusters of Christianity had slightly different views as to what it meant to say that Jesus was God, how to construct the Trinity. They all, I think they all believed in a Trinity, clearly, but how it was to be constructed, an equal, a hierarchical Trinity, that was still to be decided. Uh, and even the sort of most fundamental thing, which helps you decide those doctrinal questions, why do we have those doctrinal issues? You have those doctrinal issues because Christian texts say different things. The Christ of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is a very human being with divine connotations. The Christ of John is a very divine figure with some human connotations. What you have to do in exegetical terms is find a way of smoothing out the apparent differences between the synoptic gospel's presentation of Christ and John's gospel's question, presentation of Christ. Uh, and in fact, what you find in the so-called Arian dispute is that all the Arians are lining up John against a model they derive from the synoptic gospels and the non-Arians, the Nicenes, are lining up the synoptic gospels against the model they derive primarily from John. That's what's going on. How do we read these bloody texts to make a coherent doctrine? Well, how do we read them? We bring the techniques that uh, classically trained grammarians and rhetors had been bringing to classical literature, particularly uh, Homer, uh, in order to generate a coherent uh, reading religious reading uh, of pagan religion out of those texts. We do exactly the same things. So some things are allegories, some things are symbols. There's a, there's a whole way of not reading texts literally because if you read them literally, they don't agree. You have to read them non-literally. And your commentary tradition is all about different non-literal ways of reading them in order to generate the whole. And even that, even that sort of deep level resolution of problems of Christian doctrine and reading, they depend on the techniques of classically trained literary analysis. So, just to conclude, I'm sure you can see what I'm trying to say. This engagement between Christianity and the world, it, uh, and the Roman world, it's a dynamic of mutual transformation. Christianity doesn't just exist and then change the Roman Empire. Christianity, is, as we understand it, is sort of created by that process of engagement with the Roman Empire. And there is a very good argument, as I've been trying to show you, I think, that uh, the, the sort of pattern of conversion that we see in the fourth century, which figures and features primarily on these Roman landowning elites, that that depends on the functioning of the Roman imperial system. Because the Roman imperial system through its emperors becomes Christian, then local elites have an awful lot of incentives to come uh, into line. I think, as it were, the sort of big Chris histories of Christianity have been written stressing what stays the same over time. And that's a perfectly valid way to write the history of Christianity. But it needs to be balanced by parallel histories which stress what is different from era to era 
as Christianity is transformed. Basically, every time it meets a new group of religious consumers, Christianity changes. Well, in the late Roman world, it meets a very large body of very powerful Christian consumers, and it is changed in deeply profound ways. What, of course, this might suggest is that when the Roman imperial system ends, um, that might be a bit of a problem for Christianity. But that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for your amazing lecture. And uh, we have uh, some minutes for questions and um, domande. Carlo. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, since you, you chose not to mention the goats. I, I'm going to, <laughs> to, to, to mention them. <laughs> because, um, well, I was wondering um, if, uh, well, the model you have suggested about uh, um, the influence of, um, you know, the importance of uh, the Roman state and public life to push people to, 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 to go towards Christianity. Uh, could be applied also in case of barbarian conversions. Because um, I've been working on this subject uh, lately, and um, I'm, I'm always quite surprised when I, when I read uh, that, uh, I don't know, scholars who, who, who say that uh, um, convert barbar well, the conversion of barbarians is a conversion that uh, happened more or less overnight. You mean, I, I, I don't know, well, uh, one day they are pagans, and the other day they are Aryan Christians or Catholic Christian and so on. And, well, I, I mentioned the ghosts because perhaps it's the most famous conversion of uh, barbarian peoples. And I do, well, I think that the conversion of uh, Fritiger, Fritigern and the other Gothic chiefs was more a political choice uh, in order to get a better field uh, uh, to, to, you know, to, uh, to get engaged with the Roman Empire, to, to have uh, access to the Roman Empire, and so on. And also, I don't know, for example, for Burgundians, they are one day Catholic and then they come back as Aryan. So, I mean, I, I, I do really think that these conversions are more political conversion and they do affect only just one uh, little um, stratum of uh, barbarian society. So also, for example, uh, just uh, which is comparable, I think, also to the Roman situation because the conversion in the 4th and the 5th century is an elite conversion, not a, a countryside or Bayesian conversion. So do you think that Roman conversion and barbarian conversions are, in a way, comparable in, in this sense, or barbarian conversions are, mm, I don't know, different from this uh, system you, you've just uh, explained. Thank you. No, thank you for your question. I, I think there are a lot of similarities, in fact. Um, you, you do see very often these sort of single dates for a conversion. Uh, and obviously, in a sort of broad religious historical sense, they never make any sense. You know, it, so um, being um, English, I teach Anglo-Saxon history, and we have Augustine, the other Augustine of Canterbury, turning up in 597, and King Ethelbert of Kent eventually decides he's going to be Christian, and, we, and then other kings decide that they're going to be Christian. And you can... Um, chart the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons as a series of royal decisions, many of which are dated, you know, so you know when they did it. But on the other hand, um, they are decisions of a particular political elite to declare an allegiance in a particular um, direction. 
And if you're looking at the sort of total conversion, you know, when do you have enough priests around that everyone is being baptized, that they're going to church at least three times a year? The early medieval um, minimum demand is that people should know the Apostles' Creed, they should know the Lord's Prayer, uh, and they should know something else which is not coming into my mind. There are three things that they should know. Uh, you, know you don't have enough of a religious delivery system to allow people to be able to do this until at least the 8th and possibly the 9th century. So, you know, 200, 250 years later than those decisions. So it, it, it does mean, I think, that um, those original decisions uh, to convert, in inverted commas, are not what we really mean by conversion. There's something else. And I, I do think that that's a sort of declaration of uh, respect and allegiance very often in, um, would be a way of putting it. Um, the, you ha I think you have to take seriously the Roman state's declared ideology that it is a unique entity that's been put in place by divine forces to bring human beings to the right, correct way of life. This is what the Roman state said about itself. It's what Roman emperors say about themselves. It's what the public life and ceremonial, court life, everything, you know, everywhere you went, you'd be hit with this idea. Um, all the ceremonials, um, all ideological statements um, said this. You know, this is why Constantine has to say every time he changes policy, well, God's just told me what to do. Because, you know, emperors have a, have a uniquely close relationship to divinity. So if you do want to develop um, good relations with a Roman emperor, then coming into line with his declared religious policy is uh, a very sensible thing to do. But as you said, and I think correctly, um, it's about a small ruling group. I mean, that's what it means when, you know, if you think the Goths converted, <coughs> or if you think Fritigern's Goths converted as part of the deal to allow them across the Danube, it means that they said, yeah, we're going to be Christian. Uh, who knows what the rest were doing? They had some Christians amongst them, of course. Uh, that, I think, is the interesting thing about um, Christianity. Um, all the time, it is spreading itself horizontally, as it were, by contacts and um, by example. I think that's real. Um, I, th I suspect that the real potency of Christianity is that it can combine that horizontal influence, the kind of thing that Rodney Stark was thinking about as he thought about the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, then with a top-down conversion model. I think that's what makes it so potent in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages. It's, it's a combination of those two things. But yes, I do think sort of uh, a, a declaration of intent might be a good way <laughs> of, of glossing that conversion. Altre domande? Uh, Peter, what do you think about the, um, Alan Cameron's model on the Roman paganism and the, the conversion? Um, I, I'm pretty much happy with it, really. Um, in the sense that uh, you've got a uh, deep reservoirs of uh, traditional belief and culture in the city of Rome, uh, but we know that they only last so long. Uh, I think even um, sort of old Roman families uh, can't stay immune from the new structures of empire. So uh, by the time that you get to the early fifth century, uh, then even if you're from an old Roman um, blue-blooded family, the, the status you inherit is a clarissimus. But there are three statuses of senator, for instance. There's also spectabiles and illustris. And if you look at the rules of the Senate, 
through the fifth century, then uh, membership, or membership of the Senate and the right to speak gets restricted from clerisimi to the spectabiles and illustres, and then finally just to illustres. So you have to engage with the Roman system eventually um, in order to turn your inherited rank of clerisimus, if you're at all ambitious, into um, an active senatorial rank. So yeah, I, I think, uh, I don't find it that I disagree with him um, profoundly. What, what do you make of it, Fabrizio? I, I think that there is a problem to establish the, the ties between the politics of the Roman Senate and the religious politics of the emperor. And uh, there is the problem on the Sacerdotia in, uh, in Rome and uh, the survivors of the ancient uh, sacerdotes of the, um, the Respublica in the later uh, Roman Empire. And um, I, I think that the paganism cannot be just a creation of the, of the Christians in order to have enemies. This is... Um, the, one of the most important theories of, of Alan Cameron, and uh, so I. Um, yes, I I think that I mean, I think the you clearly see um, um, central families divided. I think between different allegiances. Um, one of the very interesting arguments that I think that Kim Bose's book puts forward is the idea that these churches that eventually become the Tituli in Rome were actually private family Christian chapels in origin. They're not being constructed by the papacy to um, provide a, a church in every locality. They are actually members of uh, senatorial classes in Rome who become Christian and therefore build their own chapel. Uh, and I, but I don't see that that, I would see that as sitting perfectly happily with other families who maintain more traditional pagan allegiances over time as well. No. Domande? Eh. Andrea. So thank you for this um, convincing perspective and uh, yeah, according to uh, to the model you just described. I was wondering whether you think that um, the Christianization of public ceremonies like um, public ceremonies that involved private life, like marriage, for example, uh, played a uh, particular or yeah, a particularly important role in this uh, conversion process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Marriage is very interesting, actually. Uh, Pre-Constantinian Christianity doesn't do marriage. It's a, it's a non-religious act. And in fact, Christianity, as you probably realize, has problem with sexual activity and procreation in general. Um, you know, you should be looking forward to the second coming and taking care of your soul, not bringing more children in to the world. So there are no Christian marriage rites um, before the fourth century. I think the, the, the first bit of evidence for uh, any Christian involvement in marriage is Ambrosi, Ambrose of Milan writing some verses for, I've forgotten who it is now, but it's two upper class people who are getting married. And he writes a sort of blessing poem. That's the first bit of Christian engagement with the act of marriage anywhere. And rites for Christian marriage are later than that, the fifth and I think sixth century before there are Christian marriage acts at all. So this is another of the sort of transformations of Christianity into a mass religion, is that it starts to take a view on what a good marriage is and how you'd say what a right marriage is and 
start to bless it, but it wasn't doing it, interestingly, before Constantine. Um, so marriage, no, but other, other things, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Altre domande? Allora, ringraziamo il professor Heather e um, ci vediamo domani alle 11 qui. E la mia lezione delle 9 non ci sarà. E, e grazie al professor Heather per questa bellissima lezione. Grazie molto.